So in the 1940s, there was this comparative religions conference in London, England, and the best and the brightest minds in the field of theology, philosophy, world religion have all come together to discuss faith and the impact that faith has on the world and the intersection that all these different world religions have with each other. And there's one question in one seminar that gets this group of academics particularly riled up, and it's the question of what makes Christianity unique versus all the other world religions. I mean, you'll hear this argument. All of these religions, they all answer the questions of origin and purpose and meaning and eternity with different stories. So what is it specifically about Christianity that makes it unique and different? And some ideas started to get thrown out in this room, and then arguments started, disagreements happened, and all of a sudden this group of learned, academic, cultured men had devolved into individual yelling matches and screaming matches with no discernible order in the room. And about 30 minutes into this conference, a man named C.S. Lewis walks in the room. And C.S. Lewis is one of the most famous thinkers, authors, theologians of all time. He's famous now, but at that time, amongst those people, he was a rock star. He was a giant. And usually when he walked in the room, people noticed. But the debate had grown so spirited that nobody even noticed him walk in. And so he took a seat in the back and he tried to understand what was being argued and debated. And then it became clear to him that it was becoming so chaotic that he would not really be able to understand what they're talking about. And so he finally stood up and he got everybody's attention. He said, excuse me, what is all this ruckus about? I mean, what are you guys arguing about? I can't even understand the question. And they said, Mr. Lewis, we're so glad that you're here. We're about a half an hour into a two-hour seminar, so I hope you're ready to buckle in and give some ideas because we'd love to hear your thoughts. The question that we're debating is what makes Christianity unique versus all the other world religions. And he's standing at this point, and C.S. Lewis looks around the room, and he says, that's easy. Grace. And he walked out. Those of you who are unfamiliar with the battle rap circuit, that's called a mic drop. And he mic dropped on the word grace. Because grace is this word that we all know. You know this word if you've been around the Christian faith for any amount of time, whether you grew up in church or whether you're new to the faith, or maybe you don't even believe in what we believe, but you've been proximate or close to people who do believe, you know this word, grace. It is the foundational element of what we believe as Christians. It's the foundational element of this thing we believe called the gospel. And so today I want to talk about grace because I actually think that we have a bad habit as believers sometimes, as people of faith, to take these foundational elements and gloss over them and take them for granted. And so we say the words a lot. We say words like grace and faith and hope and joy. We say these things a lot, but sometimes I wonder if we even really know what they mean. And sometimes I wonder if we've ever really struggled with these concepts to say, what does this mean for my life and do I even like this? Because I have this idea that until we understand our uh, what grace is and the fullness of it and how radical and revolutionary of a concept it is, we will not really understand our relationship with God. And I, I happen to think um, through, through what I've experienced in my own life and what I've seen other people experience that we struggle to embrace the fullness of grace. I think we struggle to embrace it. I think we might have a problem with it sometimes. I think even in its beauty, it causes us problems. Grace is not an easy concept to understand, and once you understand it, it's not an easy concept to embrace. And so as I talk about this today, there's two things that I want to do. To the best of my ability, I'm going to try to define for you what the fullness of grace is. What is grace, and why am I saying that it's so revolutionary? And then once we understand the fullness of it, I want to talk about why we struggle with it, why we have a problem with it. And so before we go any further, Let's just simply define it. What is grace? Grace is simply stated an undeserved gift. It's a gift you don't deserve. And the, uh, the characteristic of it being undeserved is what makes it grace. And so if you have done something to earn it, if you've done anything at all to earn that gift, it's not grace. It, it, it might be generous. It might be more than you bargained for, but it's not grace. It has to be undeserved to be grace. The way it was illustrated for me when I was in high school uh, I was in Young Life, and they told me it's like a child who disobeys his parents. And because he disobeyed his parents, he deserves punishment. He deserves reprimand to be sent to his room to be grounded. And his father instead puts him in the back seat of his car, and he drives him to Grater's and buys him ice cream. The child does not deserve that ice cream, but he gets it anyways. That's grace. 
When I was 11 years old, my younger brother Kenny was six, and at some point around this time in our life, my mom looked around our house and she said, you guys can't be in here anymore, you're too destructive. You've destroyed every anniversary present your father's ever bought for me. You've destroyed everything of value that I ever saw in the store and liked and therefore displayed on my wall. You've destroyed it all, so you have to go outside now. Go outside and play all day, and you can come back in to bathe and to sleep, and then you go back outside again. And like any responsible parent, in order to keep us occupied outside and away from the house, they gave us BB guns. And so my brother and I spent most of our childhood just walking around outside. We had three acres of property just shooting BB guns. And we would shoot trees and we would set up targets. And the only rule was no property damage. And so we would pass a lot of our time like this with BB guns. And now there's a subplot to this story, okay? The plot thickens. My dad had a habit of buying old, broken down cars that were on their last leg and he could maintenance the engines well enough to keep them running for probably two years longer than they should run, but he never had any intention of actually fixing the engines, and so eventually they would break down and he would place them in the yard with the intention of either fixing, scrapping, or selling them. Now my dad, with all grace due to him, was a very busy man, and he worked 12 hour days for as long as I can remember, and so <laughs> he didn't usually get around to that last part of fixing, selling, or scrapping. And so the cars would start to accumulate in my yard. And at any time, at any given moment in high school, there would be 15 to 20 cars in my yard, most of them visible from the street. So picture that in your head, okay? Now, back to the main story. My brother and I are out back. And this is a dramatic retelling, so just let me, let me do my thing. I turned to Kenny and I said, Kenny, this is so fun, isn't it? He said, this is amazing. What else would I want to do besides shoot things with BB guns? I said, you're right, it's great. I think I can make it better. He said, how do you figure? And I said, well, I think that we can shoot something that's more fun than trees. And he's like, like what? And I was like, I think we can shoot glass. Have you ever shot glass before? And he said, no, we're not allowed. It's property damage. I said, I know. I understand the limitations, but just hear me out, okay? When you shoot glass, come here, it shatters. And shattering glass is insanely cool. And he said, I'm sold. And we shot the windows out of five cars and my playhouse. And when my father got home and saw the destruction that we had brought upon his property in an astounding and unprecedented show of grace, he put my brother and I in the back of his car and he drove us to Grader's and he bought us ice cream just because he loved, I'm just kidding, he didn't, he spanked us, he screamed at us, he sent us to our rooms, and he stole my BB guns. And you know, now you might be saying, that's not theft, he's your dad, he bought, no, he stole them, and they were reported as such. And so my brother and I did not get shot, I was like, hey dad, there's this book called the Bible, maybe read it one time, it's called Grace. I'm just kidding, I didn't say that, I didn't know it. And don't reward your children's destructive behavior with sugar, but the illustration still stands in the same way that that child does not deserve ice cream. We as creation, as God's creation, don't deserve a relationship with him. But for us, it's actually darker than that. It's not just that we haven't deserved a relationship with God. It's not just that we haven't earned a relationship with God. It's that we can't deserve a relationship with God. We can't earn a relationship with God. There is this fractured relationship between God's creation and him that allows them unable to interact with each other. And this concept, this broken, fractured nature of our relationship is difficult to understand. And then, and then Jesus came in and he did something and I think it fixed it. And it's a hard concept to understand. And if it's hard for us to get it, if it's hard for us to embrace, then I promise you it was hard for the early church to embrace. Because the early church, before Christianity, there was no religion that was founded on a free gift. Every other world religion, and the reason that C.S. Lewis said that in that conference full of experts is because every other world religion, there is some aspect of you trying to reach God, you trying to behave your way into a relationship with God, you trying to earn God's love. And so the apostles of the early church, these early church leaders spent a lot of their time uh, teaching about this relationship with God and what Jesus meant to it. And Paul, 
who's one of the leaders of the early church. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. Paul is masterful in the way that he describes this. He's masterful in his presentation of this thing we call the gospel. And there's this one book called Romans. And Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And he had never actually visited the church, but he knew it was big and growing and thriving. And so he wrote this letter. And the first eight to nine chapters is just pure Christian theology. And it's beautiful. It describes where we are, what happened with Jesus, and what that means. And so in the beginning part, in Romans chapter 3, he starts by describing the fractured nature of our relationship with God. The fact that we are broken people. He describes it by quoting an Old Testament book called Psalms. So he quotes the book of Psalms and he says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. That's a bad start. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. It's getting worse. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now that is a dark sentiment. That is dark. And when I first started to follow Jesus, I was in college. And so, you know, you have to understand, I didn't have anybody telling me that I needed to believe this stuff because it was in the Bible. So I would see this and I would be like, how could this be? How could we be a creation that's set up like this? How could this possibly be true? How can nobody be righteous? And a, a concept that was, that was later introduced to me that really, really helped me understand this idea of our, our relationship with God is a concept called absolute depravity. Now, absolute depravity sounds dark and scary, and it is, because what it means is that you were born this way. You were born this way. Paul writes in a different letter to a different church, he says, we were by nature deserving of wrath, not by behavior, by nature deserving of wrath, which just means separation from God. We were by nature deserving of that. Absolute depravity means that you were born this way, and we in this culture, in this society, because actions matter and behavior has consequences, we think of sin and we think of the behavior. We think of the behavior itself, that thing I do that I wish I didn't do, that thing she does that hurts me, that thing he does that hurts her. We think of sin and we immediately think of the behavior. And the doctrine of absolute depravity teaches that sin is not just what you do, it's who you are. It's part of your nature. And if that's true then that means that we're not sinners because we sin. Sinners just means to miss the mark, and that missing of the mark separates you from God. And so we're not sinners, we're not separated from God because of our behavior, because of our sin. We sin because we're sinners. We behave that way because there's something wrong. The sin, the behaviors that we call sin, that we think of as sin, is simply a manifestation of our natural brokenness. With God, And the reason I'm belaboring this point is because this has severe implications on you and I and what we are to do. Because if it wasn't your behavior that fractured your relationship with God, then fixing your behavior will not mend your relationship with God. If the behavior was not what separated you in the first place, then modifying your behavior and becoming a better person will not fix the separation. And that's hard for us to understand in this culture, but it's true. And so Paul goes on. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You, me, your mom, your dad, your grandma, everybody. If it's our nature, then we all have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. And if you fall short of the glory of God, then you can't have a relationship with him. And I had a theology professor one time in college tell me that this is the most important punctuation lesson you will ever learn in your entire life. Because all of our hope in all of our future, all of our glory, all of our potential joy, all of our hope rests in whether or not there's a period at the end of the sentence. It rests on whether or not that's the end of the story. If that's a period right here, if that's all she wrote and that's a period, then we're dead. Eternal separation because we already established you can't clean it up. You can't fix it. If that's a period, we're dead. And so this concept of grace that I just took a really long time to circle back to is the truth and the fact that it isn't a period at the end of the sentence and that that is not all that was written about it. In fact, it's a comma. And I have this pastor down in Atlanta, Georgia. His name's Louis Giglio. He's a pastor of Passion City. And he says this is the glorious comma because the first part means death and this part means grace. 
And for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's grace. That's grace. And all who have fallen short are also justified for free by the grace that came through the redemption by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And so what that means is that God saw the problem. God saw this reality that there's nothing we can do. He saw that it wasn't our behavior, it's our nature. We're broken, we're broken at birth. He saw it and he said, that's not the end of the story. I won't let it be. I will not let you go on without me and I won't go on without you. And so he came to earth in flesh and blood in the person of Jesus and he died on the cross. And that death, the blood that was shed, covered our sins forever, once and for all. And now anybody who puts their faith in Jesus has a relationship with God. And that's the most beautiful love story that's ever been written. It's the most beautiful display of sacrificial love you'll ever see. And I want to highlight a few words because, I, I, like I said, I want us to embrace the fullness of how radical this is. Justified. And all are justified. That word means to be made right. Right. To be made righteous. Now think about that verbiage, to be made right. That's not a process you go through. That's not something you start down the road of and then come out the other side and you're like, oh good, I'm justified. That is a declaration. You are not processed to become justified. You are declared justified. God came to earth and he made you right. He made you right. That, that's, not, that's not something that you have any part of. You are not the active agent in the justification. God is. You are declared it. Freely, no cost. How much does it cost? It's for free. By what? Grace, the free gift that he gave us. Jesus on the cross, grace. The redemption. Redemption just means to ransom away, to pay the price once and for all, and that's why we have a relationship with him. And how do you do this? By faith. You don't actually do anything. You put your faith in God and you're declared, justified, right, And it's the most beautiful story you could possibly imagine. It's flowery, and it's sweet, and it's lovely. And if that's true, if it's so sweet, and it's so lovely, and and it's so beautiful, then why am I standing here telling us that we struggle to embrace it? If that was its fullness, that God came to earth as 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 a human, and he died, and that death justified us and declared us righteous enough to have a relationship with God, and that's beautiful, then why do I say we struggle to embrace it? Why do I say that we have a problem with grace? And maybe you don't. Maybe you don't, but I think that, that, that you probably do on some level. I know that I do. I really, the more that I understand how complete and radical and revolutionary that, what Paul wrote to the Romans was, what, what that sentence I just read to you, the more I start to understand my own inability to grasp it and my own problem that I have with it. And so I want to talk to you about some of the things that I have run into that I do think applies to almost everybody. We have a problem with grace because it insults our reality. And what I mean by that is that each and every one of us lives our own reality. A reality is just your experience. And it's shaped by your perspective, your context, the situations that have occurred in your life. And because of those, and because of, you know, the chemicals in your brain, you experience the world a certain way. Now, some experiences and some realities are pervasive. What I mean by that is is everybody sort of experiences them the same way. And one of the things that does that, that makes reality consistent, is culture. Culture is, is very powerful. And so when you're a part of a culture, everybody who's a part of that culture has a lot of shared experiences. And in our culture, in America, in the West, we don't really believe in grace. We don't see it. We don't show it. We haven't set up our society to reflect it. We think and we teach that we're a meritocracy. What that means is that your merit determines your value, your achievement, your performance. And whether that's true or not is a debate for another time, but we want it to be true, and we think it would be good if it was true. And that means that life isn't grace. Your performance dictates your value, not some free gift. It's your performance. It's your production. 
That's how we've set this whole thing up. I grew up in a family that was particularly marked by athletic achievement. Okay, Joel talked about my baseball career before I came up here. My athletic achievement pales in comparison to my family. My mom was a tower diver. You know, the, they jump off the really high tower, do flips, and then they go in the water with no splash. My mom was a tower diver at the University of Cincinnati, and she's in the University of Cincinnati Hall of Fame. She went on to compete in the Olympic trials, and she was an alternate to the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games. That means that the best divers in all the, world, in all the U.S. qualified for Olympic trials, and the top two went on to compete in the Olympics, and my mom got third. She was cheated. I can't prove it because I was three. I, I didn't even watch, but I'm almost positive she was cheated. That's the story that I tell. And so my mom was one of the best divers in the world, one of the best in the world at what she did. My oldest sister, Carrie, okay, she's, uh, she's four years older than me to the day. We have the same birthday. That's crazy, right? She went to Purdue University after winning three state championships in diving, and she was a five-time Big Ten champion and four-time All-American. She is in the Purdue Athletic Hall of Fame, and she competed in the Olympic trials. She's one of the best in the world at what she does. My other sister, Colleen, is only 16 months older than me. She did, doesn't even like sports. She's never liked sports. My parents made her play. And she was a starter on a state championship high school lacrosse team. I played Division I college baseball. My younger brother, Kenny, also played college baseball. That environment is, is similar to a pressure cooker. When you grow up in that environment, you learn very, very quickly that your performance dictates your value. How you produce dictates your value. That's who you are. That's what's shown to you every day. And I had good parents. My parents loved me, and they told me, that I was valuable outside of my performance. But it doesn't really matter sometimes, does it? Because when you put you know, a piece of chicken in a pressure cooker and you turn it on, it cooks. And you can stand there and you can tell it not to cook all you want. It's still gonna cook. And I got cooked. That's a weird analogy, I'm a piece of chicken right now. But <laughs> the fact remains, to this day, this concept of grace is really, really foreign. I don't get it. I mean, how is that true? It's not true in my experience. It's not true in my life. That's not the way I was raised. That's not how I felt growing up. Zoom out from me because that's a strange family to grow up in. Ask any athlete. Go up to a high school quarterback and say, hey, man, your value is not dictated by your performance. He'll say, really? That's weird because it seems like when I play well, everybody celebrates me. And when I play poorly, everybody boos me and gets mad at me. So what do you mean? Why are you telling me something so patently false? Of course my performance dictates my value. Zoom out from sports. Take sports out of it. Haven't we set up our economy to reflect the exact same thing? What do you do? You go to work and you perform and you're paid a wage. And if you perform well, you might get paid more. And if you perform poorly or stop showing up at all, you will be terminated and your compensation will cease. Of course, that's how our society is set up. You are how you perform. Your value is in how you produce. And that is the context that we have. We get barraged by it every single day in everything we do. You are how you perform. And so we have to be very careful as Christians to take this beautiful gospel story of grace and an unearned gift and give it to somebody whose entire experience tells them that that can't be true and say, hey, I know that this story isn't true for any of your whole life. Uh, you've never experienced anything like it, and the society and culture that you live in says that it's not true, and if it was, it wasn't good. Uh, and so I know it's not true in your life, but it's true over here. So, cool. See you later. Make sure you don't ask too many questions because we wouldn't want you to doubt. And of course it doesn't work. Of course it's hard to internalize. It's foreign. It's not how you live. It's not how we are treated. It's not the way that our society is set up, and so grace insults our reality. It does. That story, it's hard to make sense of. It's hard to internalize it. I struggle because my reality does not reflect that gospel truth that Paul wrote to the Romans. It insults our reality. Secondly, grace assaults our pride. At the end of the day, we're all prideful creatures. We have a lot of our worth built up in our own pride, in what you do, in what you've earned. And you know how I know that this is true? Because go up to somebody who's successful and say, hey, you, you got this successful because of privilege. They will get mad at you. 
Your circumstances made you this successful. You didn't really earn it. They will get mad at you because that's an insulting thing to say. And so we live that way. We believe that about our own accomplishments, achievements, self-value, and worth. And then we have this gospel message that says it's not true. And that hurts. You know, I don't think it's just that it's hard to understand. I think that we don't really like it. That's uncomfortable. If faith, your relationship with God, is the most important thing in your life, you want to earn it. I do. I want to earn my relationship with God. And grace says it isn't true. And so at the end of the day, I struggle with this because I want to check the box. I want somebody to give me a criteria and say, do these things, and you will earn God's love. And that would make it so much better for my pride, and my pride screams for that to be true. We all, at some point, on some level, want to check the box and earn God's love. When I was in a different theology class in college, I, <laughs> there was this kid who was in my class, and I would, uh, refer, I would define him sort of as a liberal arts all-star, okay? What I mean by that is he was in all these classes with me, and he would answer every question the teacher asked with long, drawn-out answers that had you know, big words and high-level philosophy. And it, I found him very annoying. I'm going to be honest with you. I found him annoying. He was in this class with me, and the teacher asked, the professor asked a very profound question. He said, what is it about the Christian faith? What is it about the Christian faith that makes you unable to check the box and gain salvation? What is it? Why is checking the box useless in the Christian faith? And this kid raised his hand. I rolled my eyes. I was like, oh, dear Lord. Have mercy on my soul. And he went on this long rant. And, and I think it was 35 minutes. It was probably closer to five. It doesn't matter. Those are both far too long of an answer. And he went on and on and on about intentionality, how if you're just checking the box, you don't have any intention behind that. You're not doing that out of love. You're not doing that out of respect or kindness. You're just checking the box, and therefore it's void, and it doesn't matter, and it doesn't count. And he went on and on and on, and he finished. And I swear to you, he wrapped it up by going like this. And that is why the Christian faith is one where you can't check the box. And the professor said, incorrect, please sit down. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I was so happy in that moment. That was like the best part of my college career. But listen to what the professor said. It was amazing. He said, incorrect, please sit down. The correct answer is that there's no box to check. There's no box to check. It's not that we're not doing the things well enough. It's that if we're broken by nature, it's not your behavior. It's futile. There's not even the framework developed for us to be able to earn our salvation, to earn God's love. But we want to really, really bad. We pretend to. We want to check the box. And so grace not only insults our reality, but it assaults our pride. And finally, and this might be the most difficult part, at least sometimes, it results in equality. Grace results in equality at the foot of the cross, at the foot of what Jesus did for us in allowing us to have a relationship with God. It is equal and level for as far as you can see. And the problem with that for us is that we don't actually believe in equality. We don't believe that we're all equal. And I'm not talking about racial equality or gender equality. I'm talking about peer to peer. We don't believe that we're all the same. We just don't. I mean, you, you live your whole life on this spectrum, don't you, that says, I'm probably better than that guy who murders people, and I'm probably not as good as Mother Teresa. I'm somewhere in the middle. That's how good I am. And Grace says no. Grace says everybody's the same, and that is beautiful when you look at Mother Teresa and you're like, oh, I'm the same as Mother Teresa, that's awesome. But it's really scary when you look at the person who's done the worst thing you could possibly imagine who's on death row, and you say, yeah, I'm actually the same as them. When you look at our prisons full of people who are no more broken than you, when you look at all of these outcasts in our society that are no less broken than you and no less saved than you, it hurts. We don't really believe that. I am not that broken. That's what we say. We point to those people. We say, I'm not that broken. I know I needed something from God, but, but I'm not the same as him. He's bad. I'm not bad. And that's why we've created this false narrative where we think good people go to heaven. If you go up to anybody on the street who's, who's a casual, whatever, cultural Christian 
and you say, do you think that you're going to heaven, which just means spending a relationship with God, spending eternity in a relationship with God, they'll say yes. Why? Because I'm a good person. The problem with what Paul wrote to the Romans is that good people don't go to heaven. And that hurts. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Justified people go to heaven. People who were saved by God and no one else goes to heaven. And what that means is that no matter who you look at, no matter where you see, everyone around you is just as broken, just as helpless, just as dead without Jesus, and just as saved, and just as loved, and just as redeemed and justified with him. And that is actually something that is beautiful in concept, but it's hard to see, man. It's hard to believe that. It really is hard. And so what happens, because grace insults our reality, it assaults our pride, and it results in equality. It makes it hard for us to really grasp it. And once we grasp it, we kind of don't like it sometimes. So what happens is we redefine it. We redefine it to fit our context, to fit what we understand, to fit our narrative. And we water it down and we turn it into something cowardly and soft and quiet. And we say it's acceptance. God accepts me. Grace is acceptance. God came to earth and accepted me. And that's really sweet of him because I can accept other people too. Even if I don't love them, I can accept them. Grace is acceptance. Grace is tolerance. We say grace is like tolerance. God came down to earth and he tolerated me. If I'm so broken, he can't really love me, so he tolerates me. And that's so nice of him to allow me to have, you know, to be tolerated by him. And that makes sense in our context, again, because we see the people around us and we say, I'll probably never love them, but I can tolerate them. That's grace, tolerance. And it's soft and it's watered down and it's lukewarm. And then finally we say it's like passive approval. God looks at us and he's like, oh, goodness. Come on in anyways. And that's what we do to other people, isn't it? So these make sense. And the problem is that it's tragic when you do that. It is tragic when you redefine it because that's not what it says. That's not what grace is. Look at what it says. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Justified. God did not come to earth to give us acceptance. He came here to give us salvation. God did not die on the cross to accept you. He came here to save you. God did not come here to tolerate you. It's not tolerance. You think God came in flesh and blood to say, you're tolerated? He came here and he gave you unmerited favor that you didn't deserve. Favor that you did not deserve. Totally unmerited favor. You are loved and you are favored and he did something for you. Grace is not passive approval. You have to understand that. Grace is not passive approval, it's advocacy. God saw the problem and what he did was he fixed it. He didn't approve of you and say, oh my Lord, come on in, fine. He came to earth and he fixed it, he advocated. Advocacy, God came to earth and what he did on the cross is nothing if it's not revolutionary and radical and crazy how much he loved us to do that for us. It's really an amazing, amazing concept and we have to see that and we have to believe that because as long as we struggle to embrace how beautiful that gift is of us being declared justified, then we struggle to understand our relationship with God because the truth is is that if you can't behave your way into a relationship with God, once by faith, you have a relationship with God, you can't misbehave your way out of it. You can't behave your way in, and once you're in, you can't misbehave your way out, and that is beautiful. And we have to understand that, and we have to see that, and we have to live that, because as long as we don't, we misunderstand our relationship with God. In the last four weeks, Joel has done a series called That's Deep, which says that the Christian depth is reaching and helping and loving people Jesus called his disciples to follow him. He said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He lived three years with them, he died, he rose from the dead and said, go feed my sheep. The same command, the beginning, as he did at the end. And here's here's the rub, as long as we think we have to earn a little bit of God's love, 
we will think that other people have to earn God's love too. As long as we think that other people have to earn God's love, we will think that they have to earn our love. And the reality is, is that they won't earn our love and they won't earn God's love. They don't deserve it and neither do you. But we all get it anyways. And it's a really, really beautiful thing. I wanna challenge this church to think about what it means to accept that gift. Think about the gift you're accepting. Think about what it means. Think about how beautiful it is that you get that for free. And think about how much God loves you to give that to you. Thank you guys for listening to me today. Um, I'm gonna close this in prayer and then the band's gonna come back up and sing uh, Worthy of Your Name. In this song, he talks about saving grace, about being the redeemer. Look at these words in light of what we talked about today. Think about them. How revolutionary and radical and extreme God's love is for you. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for today. I just pray uh, for your presence as we finish up this service. I pray that you are here. And I pray for, for this community that we can really truly understand how much we are loved by you and how much what you did for us shows it. Thank you for coming to earth. Thank you for advocating for us. Thank you for fixing the problem. Thank you for justifying us and declaring us righteous and able to have a relationship with you, Lord, if only we believe and put our faith in you. Thank you again. In your name we pray. Amen.